diversity of, of work that marine participants are doing. We've got Bridget Clarkston from CSUMB talking about um, CSUMB ocean science research experience for undergraduates. Thank you. Uh, I want to start off by also thanking Marie and the Center for Ocean Solutions for, uh, for hosting this event and for um, inviting me to speak today. It's a, it's a big honor. And I'm going to switch gears a little and talk not about research specifically, at least not yet. I'll be getting to research um, <coughs> later on in uh, my tenure here, but uh, moving towards talking about how we create tomorrow's ocean science leaders. And I admit, I switched my title slightly. I borrowed it from the tagline of the Marines website, <laughs> creating tomorrow's ocean leaders, ocean, tomorrow's ocean leaders, which when you read it, my first thought is, that's so exciting. Uh, it's so hopeful. They've got tomorrow's ocean's leaders under their belts. They've done it. Great. <laughs> I'll go back to Canada. <laughs> this job's done. Uh, and then my second thought is a little more sobering. And that's how. How do you create tomorrow's ocean leaders? And this isn't a criticism. This is um, companionship, because I I'm in the business of creating tomorrow's ocean leaders as well. And this is the, the question that is constantly on my mind. I've been living in the US now. I moved here from Vancouver uh, five months ago this week. So I've been here for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got here by way of a PhD in seaweed biodiversity and systematics and a postdoc in science education research. And so now I find myself here, lying awake at night, wondering how are we going to create tomorrow's ocean leaders. And late at night in Monterey, it's just you and the sea lions <laughs> and the raccoons. And I know either of those two groups are also wondering about creating, creating <laughs> tomorrow. And one of the reasons I'm up late at night is that, uh, so Marine, how many students in this room, or how many people in this room are graduate students currently? I'm just very curious. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I figured the balance was towards graduate students. So Marine, um, I've been reading about the, the network, um, is, is focused on early career professionals and graduate students, and that's, um, that's phenomenal. Where I come in is with the undergraduate level. So I am thinking a lot about how to create ocean leaders, starting that process, with students who are currently in their undergraduate um, majors. And one of the reasons I'm up late at night thinking about these things is uh, as part of the REU, I review a lot of applications. Actually, I read a lot of uh, students' applications to various fellowships and programs in the other program I work with called UROC. I'll explain these in a moment. And I see a lot, of, a lot of desire for positive change out there and not a lot of ability to convey that change or a lot of maturity in their thinking about I just wanted to give you just some sense of the things that I, I see that keep me up at night. Things like, my goal is to conduct research to aid conservation efforts in public policy. Uh, I aspire to obtain a PhD, instructing and motivating young adults to make a difference in the world. I know given the opportunity, I would be able to grow as a future leader in these fields of study, whatever those might be. And so what I see in students uh, is a desire to enact positive change. But this desire is often communicated in a way that's uninformed and unfocused and ultimately uninspiring. So intention alone does not bring about change. I've heard of a, a, a term used to describe, I don't know, say young people, I'm not old yet. Uh, I've heard a term tossed around in the literature recently about the advocacy generation, and these are students who are early university and, and high school level still. This desire for change, this desire to have a positive impact, to fix some of the world's problems, some of the things that the, uh, the Marine Network talks about doing uh, with the early career professionals and grad students. So there's a desire to have change, but they're not able to communicate it well. So there's not a lot of maturity yet. So when I think about leadership, my next question after how is really what? And by that I mean, okay, what do you mean by a leader? It's a broad topic. There's a lot of thought, a lot of different philosophies. And just very simply, I admit I, I am I'm new to this field. I'm new to this field of leadership and leadership training. 
having only been doing this for a few months now intensely on a day-to-day -day basis. I have mentored undergraduate students and graduate students over the years for this idea of really concretely thinking about how do we structure leadership training is, is a new field for me that I find very exciting and also very challenging. And when I and the people that I work with talk about leadership, essentially we're talking about a leader is someone who works with others to facilitate positive change. And this uh, this sort of contrasts with the stereotype I had in my head sort of growing up as a leader being an individual. And it's an individual's qualities that really bring about leadership and positive change and all that. Whereas now I'm seeing how much leadership is about a group and the environment as well as the individual. Another layer on top of this is when I talk about leadership now in my um, capacity with the the RU and Europe, I'll explain in a moment, is that we talk a lot about emotionally intelligent leaders, or we're starting to talk more about emotionally intelligent leaders. And this is shorthand for, emotional intelligence is shorthand for how well an individual manages their own emotions and manages their reactions to other people and their emotions. People who exhibit emotional intelligence have the um, not so well um, defined skill that actually helps people get around really well in the world. These, the skills of being able to manage conflict resolution, um, manage their reactions to other people and respond well to, to the emotions of other people, and to work well in groups. Responding and, and reading the emotions of others, these are emotionally intelligent skills and when you have this in leadership, um, your potential to achieve things is pretty incredible. There's three facets of emotionally intelligent leadership. There's the consciousness of self, so that's the awareness of your own emotions, abilities and perceptions, and your ability to manage your own uh, awareness of your abilities, your perceptions, your emotions. The consciousness of others is your awareness of those things in other people and your ability to work with intention uh, to bring about positive change with those other people working um, in your, your reactions to, to their abilities and emotions. And there's consciousness of context. So there's the understanding of the dynamics of the group that you're working with, and that you need to be flexible, and that group works the same way. And there's um, being aware of the environment you're working in. Your, the way you manage a team, for example, or work with a team, may work well in one uh, social setting, or one economic or political setting, but may not work well in if you have skills in these in, in these three areas, if you have developed skills in these three consciousnesses, then you are essentially an emotionally intelligent. You have the potential for emotional intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> you may not always practice it. <laughs> okay, so this sounds really complicated and abstract, and I'm gonna get to some examples in a minute. This requires training. So it's a complex process. I believe it can begin, and Marine talks about uh, you do so, I think there's been some great uh, work done here on leadership training at the graduate and postgraduate level. And I think it can be earlier. We work with students at the undergraduate level. And what I notice coming here, coming here from Canada, undergraduate research is far more developed. There's far more resources put towards it here in the United States than we have back in Canada, which I think is phenomenal. Very happy to be part of this here. What I notice when I look at efforts to inspire and train people for careers in ocean sciences, is a huge amount of resources put towards getting students authentic undergraduate research experiences and also job skills training. So there's a lot of effort put towards content specific, discipline specific training. Which is fantastic and that's a vital piece to creating the next generation of ocean scientists, ocean career, uh, whatever their ocean science career may be, and also ocean science leaders. But research experience alone does not make a leader. I also think it's not enough to keep students on an ocean science career path. That, that experience piece is vital, but it is not solely responsible for keeping students in uh, ocean science careers. I think it takes a community of support to develop leadership. And let me explain using the example of the programs I work with at Cal State Monterey Bay. I have two hats, I work with two separate but complementary programs. They get mixed up a lot, and I'll try to explain the difference between the two. 
they are quite separate. One is the research piece, and that's the Monterey Bay Regional Ocean Science Research Experience for Undergraduate Program, the REU, I'll use for shorthand. It's a program funded by the National Science Foundation. There are hundreds of them around the country. There are 33 in the ocean sciences. We have one at CSUMB. It's a pretty incredible um, program. The other place, the other hat that I wear, is the curriculum associated with our Undergraduate Research Opportunities Center. This is housed under the Academic Affairs Department, the division within Cal State Monterey Bay. Its purpose is to help students get placed in undergraduate research experiences, and there's support and training around developing as scholars and researchers. So it's a complementary program to the REU type model. And I'll flesh this out a bit. Also, since I've moved to the US, I noticed there's a great love of acronyms here. <laughs> 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 so a very, a, what I think of as a typical, stereotypical summer research experience, if we look at the academic year broken up into uh, three chunks, there's a spring term, and there's different things in the core system, the UC system, system but we can talk about a spring term, summer research period, and then a, a fall term. A typical summer research experience is a pretty standalone event where students do summer research in a lab, or with a group, and they have um, their courses during the academic year. And there isn't necessarily much support or additional activities that happen around that summer research experience. It's sort of this encapsulated experience, and then they go off and go back to their classes or their, their campus. The REU that we have at Cal State Monterey Bay is a 10-week program, it runs from June to August, it's pretty prestigious. Stud students apply from, we take students from all over the U.S. And we have a cohort of 11 students. We had 400 students apply this year. We closely examined 285 of their applications for 11 positions. We have students coming from all over the U.S., including some of the territories. We're having a student from Guam this year. What we do is we take students and we place them in this 10-week research experience in a lab at one of our six host institutions, so we've got Cal State Monterey Bay, Hopkins Marine Station, the Monterey Bay Research, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, the Elkhorn Slough Natural Estuarine Research Reserve, and of course, Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. And the students conduct <coughs> independent research projects. They answer a research question that they develop, they conduct the experiments themselves, they analyze the data, and at the end they have a tangible product in the form of a poster, that, or excuse me, a talk, that they present at our symposium uh, at the end of the summer. Mentorship is a huge piece of this program. They are paired with a primary investigator and or a graduate student mentor. Anybody in this room been a graduate student mentor to one of our RU students before? I think Sarah has. A few people, a path person. We have a cohort model, so students work, they live together in the dormitories, they have a number of professional development events, there are six big workshops that happen throughout the program, there's a number of um, additional experiences, we go kayaking, we go to the aquarium, uh, we're going to have a journal club this year, so they spend a lot of time together as opposed to just a student embedded in a lab and not having any other sort of support around that. And there's very significant pre and post REU support. We actually support the students to go and present their research from the REU at a, at a national, or excuse me, a professional level conference, uh, if that's uh, amenable to the mentor of the project worked out well enough that they can do so. So they have some additional support, as well as we provide support for them to go on to graduate school if they, if they want to. We provide help with the GRE, for example. And so there's this additional support around the actual summer research experience. We keep in touch. We stay connected. The, uh, where the UROC piece is an even more intensive complement around the summer research experience. I'm going to talk about one, sort of the flagship of UROC, which has been our UROC Scholars Program. This is a competitive program for CSUMB students. They apply, we accept them in at the sophomore level. And when they come in, they're with us for two years. They take four seminar series research courses with us. I teach these courses. 
and they start the spring term of their uh, sophomore sophomore year. So in Canada, we don't do sophomore year. The spring term of their sophomore year. So they come in in January. That first semester, they meet with me for two hours a week. There's a teaching team. There are, there are three of us who teach this team. We have 18 of these students right now. The first month is all about pre preparing applications to go on uh, to get into summer research experiences. It's writing intensive. There's a lot of coaching, helping these students write the best applications they can. This kind of high stakes writing, this is the first time for most of these students. It takes a lot of support to help them make competitive applications that are going to get them into summer programs. We support them to go off and do summer research. They don't get into a funded position. We broker positions for them in a research lab. Uh, we help them find and fund them if necessary to do summer research. When they come back in the fall, the second course they take is all about producing a product and presenting that product of their, their summer research. So if they didn't have an REU where they got to make a poster or a talk, we help them craft one and we help them go off to present at a conference. We also help them to uh, further develop their scholarly skills. <coughs> The mentorship piece here is huge. We get students, a faculty mentor, that they're paired with for two years. This is someone they meet with on a regular basis. We have a contract of expectations we all sign about the things we expect scholars to do and the mentors to provide. We provide professional development in the form of all kinds of different activities we do every week. A lot of it is about how to survive academia, how to write, what is graduate school? Most undergraduate students don't know a PhD from a master's. They don't know what it entails. They don't know what tenure means. They don't know what a professor is. It's hard to aspire to go on to be a researcher, a PhD, if you don't know what those things are. Our program lasts two years with the scholars, so we actually see them through two summers of research. Four seminar courses. The final course, the fall of their senior year, is about helping them prepare graduate school applications. Again, these are high stakes intensive writing events. The GRFP, we had five students from uh, former New York students and current New York students who got the GRFP as undergraduates this year. That's a huge fellowship for these science students to fund their graduate school. We're also learning they need a summer program element. I'd be happy to talk more about that with people. I'm actually really curious to get some feedback on um, additional things we can do since you've been through uh, your undergraduate, you, you know what it, you need to be supported to go on to graduate school. just want to give you a small selection of some of the students we've had come through our program, some of the faces of our UROC students, and I'd love to talk about some of their successes. We, if we encourage these students, we push them to be leaders, we push them to their edge on a regular basis, we push them to be leaders. This is our junior level class right now. They actually craft a, a set of expectations and goals for things they want to do, their leadership skills they want to develop as scholars and as researchers. Things like they decide they want to uh, improve on their writing, they want to build their community, they want to get a, develop a better relationship with their mentors, they want to improve their broader impacts aspect of their research. And just to quickly sum up, these two programs are incredibly successful. I have been so amazed at how successful these programs are. And I'm very happy to be stepping in and helping to be part of it. The REU is only its second year. We've had 400 applicants for this year's 11 slots. It's a pretty unique REU in the sense that it has, it's one of the only two of the ocean science REUs that has an ocean engineering component. We're very fortunate to have so many um, marine science, has such a rich complement of marine science partners in the area. And our distributed model is because we have that rich complement of marine science institutions here, including Los Angeles. UROC's only been around since 2009 and has placed 265 different students in research experiences. That's 265 students across about 460 different placements. So students usually get placed in multiple research placements. 72 of our students have gone on to graduate school which I think is, is pretty incredible. We target students who are first generation, who are college, low income students, uh, from underrepresented groups, and we are, um, our, our target for both programs is to help increase the diversity and retention of students into graduate school and into things like ocean sciences, 
The RA, the UROC, for example, as I should say, is actually non-STEM specific. We have we work with all disciplines across our campus. So to sum up, I think tomorrow's ocean science leaders need complementary training in research and leadership. And our challenge going forward, it sounds like we're doing really well, but my challenge, there's twofold. How to meet the growing demand for research and leadership training? Because number one, a number of our students we want to take in, first generation, low income, underrepresented groups, this two year intensive program is prohibitive to them. They're transferring in from a community college, it's already enough of a challenge to come to a four year institution, to throw them into a two year intensive scholars training program is too much for them. So we need to figure out how we can serve these students as well. And number two, we're trying to scale up to serve even more students. We have a staff of eight now from an original staff of one. We can't serve and coach students at the intensity that they need um, for all the students who want these kinds of this kind of help. So that's the challenge moving forward. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. So we can take a few. Yes. Uh, so I'm curious, you said that for the REU you had like 400 applicants for only 11 spots. So it seems a shame to me that you've got so many people who are interested in these sorts of programs and so few spots available. Do you have any thoughts on how we can increase opportunities like this for students who want to participate in them? This is another question that keeps me up at night. I should say we had 400 students apply. We had only 285 of those were applications we seriously consider. There's a number of students who apply for things and they just apply for a lot of things that are not actually competitive. Uh, I don't know what the answer is. There are not enough research placements for the number of students who want them, and graduate programs are expecting more and more students to have an authentic research experience under their belt before they'll accept them into their program. And there just simply aren't enough placements. So I don't know what the answer is. I, I, what I would like to see, because I'm a curriculum developer by training as well, and I'm a university teacher, I'd like to see more of an authentic research experience provided in classes, and there are ways you can do that. It's, it's a bit of a challenge, it's a huge challenge. But that's one way that we're gonna have to address, address this issue, is move it more into the curriculum. That's one potential. Uh, given the competitiveness of the application process, what are some of your selection criteria, especially uh, as it relates to emotional intelligence? How do you select that's a that's really good. That's a really good question. It's a real challenge. The REU has a mandate to uh, we prioritize sophomore and junior level students because these are the we want to give them and we want to give them their first research experience. <coughs> so if a student has had an REU experience before or a lot of from an NSF REU experience before, we have them on a lower priority. And if they've had a lot of other types of research experiences, we also give them lower priority because we're trying to give opportunities to students who don't have a lot of access to STEM uh, research and who are coming from underrepresented groups in the ocean sciences. That's one of the ways. So we're looking for potential. At the sophomore and the junior level, especially at the sophomore level, your letter writers are huge in helping a student get into a program. because. Students often don't have the experience yet to really speak for themselves through their transcripts and through their, their own writing. So the letter writers tell you how much potential a student has. Yeah, that's one thing for people who are writing letters for students. The letter writing, I'm learning now. I'm learning how to train. That's one thing I didn't mention. We provide mentorship training to our mentors because that's huge, right? You, you don't, I didn't know how to, how to mentor undergraduate students. I just sort of did it the way I was taught myself. Now I'm in the business of training the mentors and how to properly you know, train their students, including write letters that are compelling. All right, one more question. Um, you talked a lot about preparing students for graduate school, um, but there are so many other ways to do science outside of academia. I mm -hmm. wonder, does your program um, also prepare people for um, you know, science related jobs in the private sector or the public sector outside of academia? That's a really great question. UROC is scaling up and we're starting to serve more students. Our funding is primarily, one of the big funding providers we've had, we currently have, is from the Department of Education's McNair Scholars Program. And 
they, that program specifically wants students to be going, targeting PhD programs. So it's sort of been in the past that was what the funding dictated. We do want to serve students who want to go on into uh, their scholarly career, whatever that might look like. It doesn't have to necessarily be graduate school. But the RAU, the, the mandate is to serve students who want to pursue careers in ocean sciences, not necessarily graduate school, but that often is, is a piece. We want to provide the support for that as well. So there are two separate complementary programs. All right, let's thank Bridget.